With the second largest population of Muslims in the world, India is as Islamic a country as any other. Conventional wisdom has it that Islam first came to India with the conquest of Sindh by Muhammad bin Qasim in the early 8th century. Ironically, both North Indian historians and their Pakistani counterparts subscribe to this theory. The fact is that the oldest mosque in India was built on this site in Kerala. Even before the advent of Islam, the Arabs had established several trading settlements along the Malabar coast. After the Arabs had converted to Islam, their faith was imported into India along with their merchandise, dissimilar cargoes brought in aboard seafaring dhows of the kind that are still made today in this region. The Arabian trading communities gradually established themselves and their religion. The Muslim community on the Malabar coast, the result of a marriage between the Arabs and the local population, are called the Moplas. The term is derived from Mapila, meaning bridegroom or child. The echoes of the Arab influence on the culture of the Moplas can be heard in the music of A.R. Rahman. This continuity is like this that make up India's cultural mix. The very name India is derived from the name of the river Sindhu or Indus. The West at various points of time referred to the land as Ind, India or Hindustan. The Sindhu river has also given its name to the region that forms its most important hinterland, Sindh. A century after Islam arrived on the Malabar coast, another wave of Islam reached Sindh and in due course spread from there to other parts of the subcontinent. Around the same time, Islam was also taking root in different areas of the world and its effects varied from region to region. Kosambi comments on the spread of Islam barely a hundred years after the Prophet's death. Islam spread from Europe to Asia. In Europe, it liberated the peasants from exactions of the church and of the kings. In Persia, it liberated the peasants again from exactions of the kings and the nobles. In India, Kosambi compares the coming of Islam with the coming of the Aryans and says that Islam brought in new technology and freed forces of production. This is not exactly true because while the Aryans brought huge areas under the plough, Islam did not do so. What the Muslims did was they brought in a lot of technology. They brought in Chinese porcelain, tea, silk, gunpowder. But they did not really change the forces of production in a drastic sense. However, what they did was they did liberate the peasants to a certain extent and provided that force rather than religion became the basis of the state.
Delhi was the theatre where the state manifested itself most forcefully and it was here that much of the action took place during what is known as the Delhi Sultanate. Along with the Roman Empire, this is the only example where a long period of imperial system is not known so much by uh, dynasties but uh, the locus of power, the capital, Delhi. And that name is Delhi Sultanate. The second thing is that Sultanate gives clearly the indication that this imperial system was not based on any ideology, not on any creed, not on any basic principles, but purely on naked brute force. The word Sultanate is derived, its origin is Sult, and the dictionary meaning of Sult is power. Away from the seat of power, the peasant at the bottom of the heap continued to toil much as his forefathers had done in the centuries before Islam. The Persian wheel was one of the technological innovations of that period. But for the common man, the wheel of time turned much as it always had. Ancient beliefs and ways of life persisted. The remains of the Buddhist stupa over the ruins of Mohenjo-daro are a reminder of the pre-Islamic Buddhist presence in Sindh. In fact, the first Muslim raids in Sindh and elsewhere under Muhammad bin Qasim were made easier by the hostility between the Buddhist peasants and the Brahmins who'd overthrown Buddhist rule. After they had conquered Sindh, the aim of the Muslims was to secure an outlet to the sea via the Indus. This took two centuries to accomplish, not such a long period in a land where time takes its own monumental pace to become history. History has many methods of inventing itself and reinventing itself. And monuments have many meanings. Sometimes these meanings are deliberate. Monuments are built and then rebuilt. On the other hand, many monuments have people just move into them and give meanings which are very different from the ones originally intended. Take the case of monuments associated with Mahmud Ghazni. Mahmud Ghazni raided India around 1000 AD. And it is well known that he went up to Somnath and destroyed the Somnath temple. Centuries after his time, the Somnath temple was rebuilt. It is not so well known that Mahmud Ghazni also destroyed a large number of Ismaili settlements and mosques on his way, suggesting in fact that his raids had more to do with plunder than with religion. Mahmud Ghazni's raids are vivid in popular memory, but in reality they did not have a lasting effect. Later incursions by the Muslims were more significant. They tended to move into previously inhabited sites as the recent archaeological findings at Lal Kot near Meroli show. Earlier, Prithviraj Chauhan is said to have ruled from the fort here. Later, Delhi was to have many incarnations here and elsewhere. At Kara near Allahabad, the tale is still told of the bitter enmity between the chivalrous Prithviraj Chauhan and his unwilling father-in-law Jaychand. और इसका ये है कि राजा जयचंद यहाँ रहता था और संजोकता के बारे में लड़ाई हुई जिसके बारे में यहाँ मुसलमान आके इसके ऊपर काबू किए मोहम्मद गौरी और जब उन्होंने काबू किया वो काबू इस तरह किया कि वहाँ पर जाकर कि ये संजोकता को जब ले गया पृथ्वीराज चौहान जब वहाँ ले जाने के बाद में तो इन्होंने मुसलमानों को बुलवाया पृथ्वीराज चौहान को पर चढ़ाई करवाया उनको तो शिकस्त दिया फिर ये राजा कड़ा जयचंद के ऊपर भी उन लोगों ने चढ़ाई करके इनका भी काबू किया इनका भी खत्म कर तो वो पृथ्वीराज चौहान यहाँ आए और आने के बाद में संजोकता को घोड़ा पे बैठा के ले गए एक वही रिकॉर्ड है आज का कि कड़े की तोहिन उसी वक्त 
It was Muhammad Ghori who consolidated Muslim rule by defeating the feudal Rajput rulers of North India. The various dynasties that followed Muhammad Ghori built upon that foundation. Qutbuddin Aibak, Ghori's slave as well as one of his generals, founded what is today called the Slave Dynasty. Qutbuddin began the construction of one of India's most recognizable monuments, the Qutub Minar at Delhi. It's not clear what its original purpose was, although it was evidently built with material taken from Hindu and Jain temples. The structure has intrigued visitors for centuries. Was it a symbol of the imperial aspirations of Qutbuddin and his successor Iltutmish? Did the mighty tower seek to convey the same message of imperial might as the nearby iron pillar had done for centuries? And what does it stand for today when both space and time have acquired new dimensions? Situated within the labyrinths of what is now known as Old Delhi, this humble grave is just as eloquent, in its way, as the most flamboyant of the monuments of the Delhi Sultans. The grave is that of Razia Sultan, daughter of Iltutmish and the first woman ruler in India. Razia met a tragic end a victim of patriarchy and of the palace intrigues which were an endemic feature of the Sultanate. This placid setting on the Gangetic Delta or Doab was the unlikely launching pad for one of the master intriguers of this period. Alauddin Khilji began somewhat humbly from Kara where his life had been made most miserable by his nagging wife and mother-in-law. Possibly to escape them, he proceeded to Deogiri in the Deccan and conquered the formidable Yadava fort there. Returning north with the massive booty from his Deccan campaign, Alauddin plotted to kill his uncle, the king Jalaluddin. Jalaluddin met his untimely end in the waters of the Ganga at Kara. Alauddin then established himself as a ruthless ruler at Delhi. He took on the invading Mongol hordes from the fort he built at Siri. Today its crumbling remains share the skyline of South Delhi with brash pretenders. At nearby house khas, children play in the shadow of a once sinister monument from the times of Alauddin Khilji. The Chor Minar is a very interesting structure. It was built by Alauddin Khilji, possibly to strike terror in the hearts of thieves and perhaps even of the Mongols who raided Delhi. Their severed heads used to be stuck to poles and the poles used to be stuck to the holes which are in the minar. This obviously put the fear of God or at least the fear of the Sultan into the heads of uh, wrongdoers. Alauddin Khilji established an empire which was based more or less on the principles of the Arthashastra which prescribed a centralized rule which would be carried out through the enforcement of very strict discipline in many spheres. One of the things which he carried out was price control. Alauddin used to send little boys from his court to various shopkeepers and ask them to buy things. 
to examine whether the shopkeepers had short changed or short weighed the goods. If it was found that the shopkeepers had a short weighed, then the soldiers used to be sent in order to cut off equivalent amounts of meat from the haunches of the shopkeepers. There were many cases of overweighing in Sultan Alauddin Khilji's time. In a way, Alauddin tried to recreate the centralized empire that the Mauryas had built more than 1,500 years earlier. This is the imperial phase. Almost the whole of India, right up to Madura, is brought under one single political system, which uh, in the background of the political fragmentation and a small petty states warring against each other is definitely a very significant step. The second thing is that uh, this centralization also results in a different kind of thing and that is that uh, now the government goes down to the level of the villages, the countryside and establishes authority. This is done through the revenue system. The entire revenue is collected through the intermediary, no doubt about it. Then it goes back to the center and from the center again it gets back in terms of commission on wages to the officers. So this uh, I use always to compare the system in terms of uh, an electric grid system. That earlier you have local powerhouses producing power to be consumed locally. Now what exactly happens is a person sitting in there is controlling the distribution, collection, generation. So that is where you find that in terms of the structure of the government, that is a, a very fundamental development. The other thing is bureaucracy. Paper, as you know, came into India very late with the Turks. And yet we find in the uh, description that uh, say parch, gram, and small kind of things, snacks, shopkeepers were selling it wrapped in paper, which is uh, astounding, which means this is the raddi. From the bureaucracy it is being disposed of and so much paper comes in. So this is another important thing that where you find the records and officers and clerks and ummas and uh, other people sitting down, jotting down notes and giving instructions, paperwork goes on. Ironically, the bureaucracy in Alauddin's time provided the Sultan with an efficient system of revenue collection, which made the empire extremely prosperous. In a fashion similar to that of the Mauryas, Alauddin decreed that there was to be one rule for the payment of tribute. This became applicable to all, from the chieftains to the scavenger. The heaviest tribute was not to fall on the poorest. All cultivation was to be carried on by measurement at a certain rate for every unit. Half the produce was to be paid and this rule was to apply without the slightest distinction. Another rule related to buffaloes, goats and other milk giving animals. A tax for pasturing at a fixed rate was to be levied on every house so that no animal, however so wretched, could escape the tax. Quite obviously, Alauddin did not go out of his way to court popularity. The revenue that Alauddin accumulated enabled him to begin the construction of a tower, the Alai Minar, which was to be so tall that it would dwarf the Qutub Minar. It remained unfinished and stands perhaps as an appropriate symbol of Alauddin's reign. The Tughlaqs who followed the Khiljis also had a checkered history. The Tughlaqabad fort on the outskirts of Delhi is a reminder of the reign of Ghyasuddin Tughlaq. His rule came as a welcome relief to the class of feudal landholders who had dreaded Alauddin's exactions. Alauddin had whipped the nobility into shape, but Ghyasuddin Tughlaq once again tried to strengthen his hand by making concessions to the feudal aristocracy and the landholders. There's an interesting story about the construction of the Tughlaqabad fort. The saintly Sheikh Nizamuddin Aulia was in the middle of a project to provide people with a tank to collect rainwater when 
Sultan Ghiasuddin announced his plan to build the massive fort. All laborers working on private projects were ordered to report immediately to the king's works. The sheikh requested the Sultan to spare a few men for his bauli, but was refused. Upon this, Nizamuddin is said to have cursed the fort. Ya rahe ujjar, ya base gujjar. It will either remain uninhabited or will be occupied by the wild gujjars. As it happens, the prophecy did come to pass. When Giyasuddin Tughlaq was in Bengal, he was told that Sheikh Nizamuddin Aulia was questioning the king's authority. The Sultan decided to come to Delhi to punish Nizamuddin. At which point Nizamuddin is supposed to have said, Hanuz Delhi Durast, Delhi is still far away. What actually happened was that when the Sultan reached the borders of Delhi, his son, who later got to be known as Sultan Muhammad bin Tughlaq, erected a massive welcome arch. And precisely at the moment when Papa Deer was under the arch but the sun was not, the arch came collapsing, killing the Sultan. The reign of Ghiasuddin lasted only five years. The martial and arrogant Sultan lies buried in this tomb at Tughlaqabad. And the fort to this day lies abandoned, overgrown and frequented only by Gujjars and their herds. Ghiasuddin's son and successor was not just an inventive parricide. Mohammed bin Tughlaq did many other things, some of which were fairly significant. Every time you handle a currency note, for instance, think of Mohammed bin Tughlaq. It was he who started token currency in India. Mohammed bin Tughlaq did not like the fort Ghiasuddin had built and he moved away from here all the way to Dalatabad in the center of India. The reason was that he was afraid that the Mongols who were coming from down the hills and through the plains of Punjab would attack Delhi which was fairly vulnerable. He wanted also to place the capital in an area which was central to the whole of India. Already the concept of India was emerging. The concept of India as one geographical entity which would have a centre. And the centre was the geographical centre which Muhammad bin Tughlaq chose. The shifting of the capital to this fort at Deogiri, which Alauddin Khilji had conquered earlier, was perhaps the supreme act of imperial arrogance in this period. The entire population of Delhi was given just three days to make the move. The Dalatabad fort, as it was renamed, represents the state-of-the-art security measures of the period. But no amount of theoretically uncrossable moats, labyrinthine secret passages and mazes could prevent the fort from being repeatedly breached. Naturally, the method used was not brute force, but treachery and deceit. Dalatabad fell and did so repeatedly. It fell because precisely the nature of feudalism which sustained it was over elaborate. It did not have support of its peasantry, nor did it have such devotion among the courtiers that they would not betray it to the enemy. Muhammad bin Tughlaq's successor, Firoz Shah, built yet another Delhi and named its central fortress after himself. The Firoz Shah Kotla was the capital from which the new Sultan reinforced the feudal hierarchical order. Firoz Shah dug two canals from the Jamna and the Satlaj, both via Karnal into Delhi, and had many lesser waterworks built. He is also responsible for imposing the Jazia poll tax on Hindus, thereby instigating religious discrimination, a feature that showed up time and again in India. Yet what this Muslim Sultan is best known for today is the care with which he transported two Ashokan pillars to Delhi. He had them re-erected there as symbols of imperial concern for the ancient 
and wondrous artifacts of Indian civilization. If Islam had taken firm roots in India by this time, it was not just due to the efforts of kings and soldiers. Among its greatest popularizers were the Sufis like Khwaja Moinuddin Chishti, whose Darga at Ajmer is venerated equally till today by Muslims and Hindus alike. What Sufism achieved was the synthesis of several strands of religious thought and it sought to popularize this through the language of the common people. In India itself, several silsilas or traditions of Sufi thinking flourished. The most enduring was the Chistia Silsila. The branches at Chist near Herat have not survived, but the Silsila founded by Khwaja Moinuddin in India flourishes until today. The Dargah of Sheikh Nizamuddin Aulia is a shrine dedicated to the most famous successor of Khwaja Moinuddin Chishti. Nizamuddin's teachings draw from Islamic, Hindu, Buddhist and Christian traditions. The most famous disciple of Nizamuddin Aulia was the great poet, musician, courtier and historian Amir Khusro. He is said to have invented the sitar and in his verses he raised the status of the Hindui language which drew from Sanskrit, Arabic and Persian. Than the sultans who came and went, it is Amir Khusro who best represents the period when India further evolved its composite culture. The relationship between the spiritual seers and the secular state reached its high point two centuries later under Akbar the Great, who built the Buland Darwaza at the feet of his Sufi mentor, Sheikh Salim Chishti.